Good morning and welcome to Campbell Pentecostal Church Online. Thank you for joining us today. You know, yesterday we had to make a decision. The weather forecast was for rain and damp and cold. Nice to know once in a while the weatherman is wrong as well. Anyways, we're online today and we're thankful that you've joined us. However, next Sunday, Thanksgiving Sunday, we will be reopening the doors to the church once again as we relaunch our indoor services. So we just want to take a moment to invite you to come and join us next Sunday at 10 o'clock. We do understand that perhaps not everyone will feel comfortable and that is okay. We will continue to be online. Or if you really want it, you could just come and sit in the parking lot and listen to the service on the radio. Lots of choices. Just continue to remember everyone in prayer and that would be appreciated. One more thing is, beginning next week, we want to again be a part of Operation Christmas Child with the Christmas shoe boxes. Boxes will be here at the church for pickup and you can get yours or if we can deliver some to you we'd be happy to do that as well. Or another option is that you can go online and do it there right on the Operation Christmas Child webpage. Or thirdly a few people have always just donated to the church and the church passes it on. So however you would like to be involved, probably more than ever, this year is an important year uh, for children around the world to know that they're loved and cared for. So we're going to watch a short video about Operation Christmas Child. Then Joe and Daphne are coming to lead us in worship again this morning. Out of three, when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. I'm going to read from... Uh... The ESV, 1 Timothy 2, 1-4. to First of all, then, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high position, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of, our, of God, our Savior, who desires our people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, Heavenly Father, we just lift up your name this morning. We, we lift you up, Jesus, because you said that when your name is lifted up, when you are lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We magnify your holy name. You are, I am, you are the everlasting one. You are the ever-present, all-powerful, almighty, and we glorify you. We are in awe of you, Father God. And Lord, Father, we just uh, lift before you our, first of all, Israel. We, we lift the people of uh, Jerusalem before you and we speak peace. We pray your shalom peace over all of them, uh, Arabs and Jews and all of those who live in Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We lift up our leaders. We lift up uh, uh, Justin Trudeau and, and our provincial leaders, uh, Doug Ford and, and our municipal um, mayor. Uh, all those people that are dealing with a very tough situation these days. And we just pray for your grace and, and your wisdom and discernment upon them. We pray for godly influence to uh, come upon their path every day to just uh, minister to them the way, the truth, and the life. You are the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus. So we pray for that. We pray for our, our community, uh, our church, and we pray for our neighbors, Lord. Um, 
I thank you that your desire is that none should perish. So I lift up all of our neighbors before you, all of our unsaved family members, and I pray that uh, there would be a mighty move of your Holy Spirit upon the land, and that uh, there would be, there would be uh, our love, your love in us, shining for this world to see right now as they, and as we need it so much in Jesus name. Amen.
and Daphne for leading us in worship once again. Last Sunday was the Day of Atonement given to Moses in the book of Leviticus for the Jewish people to remember each year. It was the most solemn, holiest day in their calendar. They had to take time to focus in upon their sins and their need for redemption, for atonement and forgiveness. And part of the day was they took a goat, called the escape goat, led him to the edge of the camp or to the city, and then released him, chased him out. It symbolized that sin separated us from God. And then there was a sacrifice upon the altar. The blood was needed to be taken into the Holy of Holies, to make atonement for their sins. But it was only a temporal atonement that had to be repeated each year. From the book of Hebrews, we know that it was a foreshadow that pointed to Christ as the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate atonement for our sins. On the cross, when Jesus died and rose again, he dealt with the sin question once and for all. Today we will remember and celebrate Jesus' sacrifice and victory on the cross as he took our place. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper or the communion time, Paul in his instructions to Corinthians. Today we will remember and celebrate Jesus' sacrifice and victory on the cross in our place. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper, our communion time, Paul, in his instructions in 1 Corinthians, tells them, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning 
against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine himself before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. As I was thinking about communion this morning, the following verse came to my mind. I first learned it as a youth, and a part of a youth choir, one of the songs, I had to say this verse. Therefore, I want that man everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath, anger, or disputing. Father, I pray this morning that this verse would speak into our hearts and our lives. Would this verse pierce our conscience, pierce our hearts, so that we can be more like you and honoring you and one another more and more each day, we pray. Amen. I want to read the previous seven verses found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 1 says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And if that sounds familiar, Minnick read those verses before she prayed this morning. Verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to you at the proper time. For this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And I am a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want man everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. So our focus will be on the words of this verse. I want the youth to remember, grade 6 and up, about my email yesterday. And my challenge to you, as we look at this verse, to find what I think the key word or words are for us today. So when after the message is over and you think you have it, text me, give me your name, and tell me the word or words, what they are. And we have a prize for you. As I began studying this after reading it, I turned to my Greek-English interlinear of the Bible. And here it is. As I studied it, it has the English and then the Greek word, and then it has the literal translation. So let's get started. It begins by the word therefore. Therefore in Greek means then, now, in turn. In response, consequently, by all means. Take the phrase in response. Therefore in response, it refers to the previous verse, verse 7. It says, for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and apostle. I'm telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So therefore, because of this, I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you now. I am an apostle. Listen closely. Paul wants, and he gets their attention by that opening word. Therefore, I want. And it means I am intending, willing, or in turn it will happen. It indicates a rational, planned desire. Sometimes, some of the translations translate it as wish. But it's not an impulsive, wishy-washy, fairy tale wish. 
Paul's trying to say it this way. It is my prayer and goal. It's my desire. It's my wish. I want you. And let's continue on. I want the man everywhere. The man he's talking about here is literally the man in the church to begin with. Later on in this chapter, he dresses the, the ladies as well. But as we look at this, note the principle. It's for all men. It's for men of all times, all ages. But it also includes all people. It does not e exclude women here. Instead, it includes women and children as well as he addresses this problem. So ladies, please listen as well. Men. Men everywhere. Now everywhere is made up of two Greek words, meaning every and place, or every place. And the New Living Translation translates it this way, every place of worship. And if you read 1 Timothy, it fits into the context. He's speaking to the church where they gather to meet and worship. And that's where he wants them as well. The man everywhere, wherever they are, at home, but especially in church as well. What he wants them to do is to pray. And the Greek word is very simple, to pray or to be praying. And as we look at the New Testament usages and the Greek connotation, it means that it's an act of prayer, but it's an attitude of prayer as well. The heart attitude is very much part of what God is looking for when we pray. Interestingly, the New Testament prayer is never negative. It's positive. With perhaps the exception of the prayers described of the Pharisees who were hypocrites who prayed for all show rather than faith. And then, the only other real negative kind of prayer is referred to in the New Testament when some of the letters address the churches and tell them that they need to pray with faith. You have not because you ask not. You don't believe when you pray. But all the other occasions when we are exhorted to pray, it is a very positive statement. Prayer throughout the Bible and in Jesus' life we see is personal, one-to-one -one with our Heavenly Father. It can be private or public. It can be private in the sense that two or three share and pray together. The Bible says that two or three gather together in my name. There I am in the midst. And so when the two or three people are praying together, God is there with them. We know from the scriptures that a three-chord is stronger than a two-chord strand. And so prayer is that. And there's also the place for public prayer, that a person would lead out in public and pray. And there's also prayer meetings where people privately pray and pray out loud individually. Prayer is so inclusive of so many things. Make sure that you pray many, many ways. You can say, memorize prayers or read out of a prayer book if you want. As long as you read them sincerely, pray from your heart. And always make sure when you are praying that you are praying from your heart. One of the other interesting things in the New Testament that expands a little bit more than the Old Testament, it connects fasting and prayer together. Now we can find some examples in the Old Testament, but the New Testament links these two closer together. As I was studying the Jewish feasts the last couple of weeks, one of the interesting things that I discovered was that for the feast where they fast, they usually don't pray. I associated fasting and prayer together. But in these Jewish holidays, there are prayers that are said, and, and it's a time of fasting, but it's not a time of solid fasting and solid praying. One other New Testament introduction to prayer that we see is that of intercession. That we would intercede, pray for others. When we bring our own needs, we are 
um, thanking God. And I trust that thanks and praise is a part of your prayers. But when that's what petitioning is all about, bringing our needs. But when we're interceding, we're petitioning for the needs of others. The other thing I just want to remind you of is that as Christian believers, we all should be prayer warriors. And so Paul is speaking to all of us, all the men, all the women, all the kids. Let's hear what he has to say about our prayers and praying. He says that I wish that men everywhere would pray, lifting up holy hands. And so how, let's have a look at this. He's talking about lifting up. And it's a simple word that just literally means to lift up. Then the word for holy means to be devout, to be pious, and to be sanctified. And the idea of sanctification is that one is set aside to be used of the Lord. One is set aside to be free from sin. One is set aside to be honored by God. So he wishes that all men would pray, lifting up holy hands. So let's backtrack a minute here. Back in the Psalms, 28.2, it says, Listen to my prayers for mercy as I cried out to you for help, as I lift my hands towards your holy sanctuary. Psalm 63, verse 4, I will praise you as long as I live, lifting my hands to you in prayer. In 1 Kings chapter 5, excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 8. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 54, it's at the time where Solomon dedicates the temple. This is what he says. When Solomon finished making these prayers and petitions to the Lord, he stood up in front of the altar of the Lord, where he had been kneeling, with his hands raised towards heaven. In Luke chapter 24, verse 50, it says, talking about the ascension when Jesus ascended back to heaven. Then Jesus led them to Bethlehem, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. Lifting your hands can represent surrender. It can represent praise and worship. It can represent blessing faith to God. And so let's allow God to take our hands as we lift them up and pray to him. Interesting, I thought of this story back in Exodus chapter 17. It's during the battle where Moses and the children of Israel are fighting the enemy. And as Moses was there, it says he had his hands lifted up. And as his hands were lifted up, the battle was going good. But as he got tired and his hands started to come down, the tide seemed to turn. And so his brother knew that. So two people came alongside him and held up his hands. They held it. It says Moses' arms soon became tired, so he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone to, for him to sit on. They stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands held steady until sunset, and they won the battle. We too need to be ready to help and to encourage one another, to lift up one another's hands. And we need to realize that our hands are holy, not because of who we are, and the word holiness here of devout, pious, sanctified, we need to remind ourselves that Jesus makes our hands holy. He sets them apart. You know, I really think we need to remind ourselves and understand the character of God. And I'm going to suggest this morning that God's number one character of his being is that of holiness. You would say, but, but, but what about love? What about mercy? What about that? We will never fully know God's love and appreciate God's love and mercy for us until we understand that he is a holy God. And that holiness demanded him 
to find a way, demanded that he send his son to die on the cross for your sins and my sins, that we might have holy hands. And so today we often overemphasize his love, his mercy, at the true cost of appreciating what Jesus has done for us and his holiness. If Jesus is holy, we shall allow him to make us holy, to make our hands fruitful, that the fruit of the Spirit would flow out of our lives, out of the works of our hands. If not, our hands will be used for the flesh, for selfish desires, rather than for God. So Paul says, I pray that man everywhere would lift holy hands. And it says, without. And the Greek word here literally means apart from, free from. We're supposed to be new creations. And he has set, sanctified us, he has set us apart. And so we are to be without. And he lists two important things that we are to be without. That we are to be free from as believers in Jesus Christ. Here they are. The first thing is anger. And the Greek word for anger literally means ignignation. Anger. Wrath. I thought of Colossians 3.8. Paul says now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. I always find it interesting the partners to go in the groupings of words and of sins. Anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. We're told to get rid of them. But I also thought of the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It says, be angry and do not sin. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I often tell people I'm talking to them and they're sharing their needs and concerns. Anger is just an emotion. It's a feeling we have. How we deal with it gets us into trouble. If we allow it to control us and we react, we tend to sin. We tend to hurt others. Sometimes some godly anger motivates us more than anything else and helps us change the world for good. But be angry and sin not. Don't let sin, don't let anger control you. And very practical, when we are angry, and every so often we do in our relationships, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Deal with the situation. Get over the anger. Ask for forgiveness. Move on. Don't hold on to it. And so Paul says that his desire for us as we pray that we would be free of anger. And then it says, or disputing. And it's interesting, the Greek, the word or can be also translated as and. And so make sure you are free of anger and or disputing. The Greek word here literally means a through account of a time of reasoning, a time of disputes, controversy, arguments, quarreling, doubting. All of these things Paul says we need to get rid of. Therefore, I want man to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. You know, as I thought about our day and age that we are in today, there's too much anger and disputing, too many controversies in our world today. We look at countries around the world who are at war, and especially internal wars and genocides where they hate one another. I look at the world and we hear the horror stories of racism. I 
lot of the racism has anger involved and they lash out. As I consider COVID-19, I see much anger and disputing as well. Whether it's masker versus anti-maskers, vaccines versus anti-vaxxers, whether we question the costs and the effectiveness of vaccines, there seems to be so much anger. So much disputing. I'm right, you're wrong. Back and forth. I think of our own local community right now. And there seems to be a lot of anger about the new proposed jail. I think back to the last three, four local elections. Here and in some of the communities around us. And they've had some nasty streaks controversy, disputing, and people full of anger. I think if we're honest, we look at our church, every so often we see some anger and controversies within our midst as well. Once in a while, it's a difference of opinion over worship. What style? How loud the music? New versus old. Today, sometimes we have different opinions on COVID-19 and how is best to handle it. I just want to say it's okay to have different opinions. It's okay to have different perspectives. It's okay every so often to agree to disagree. But we need to disagree agreeably. To show respect to one another and the various opinions that we have. You know, I may just be wrong in my opinion. But you know what? I usually don't portray that. I tend to go like 100% out. I'm right and you're wrong. And when we have that attitude, we show a lack of respect. And these will hinder our prayers. This will rob us of our joy. It will destroy our unity. Then we will not be able to lift our hands an effective, God-honoring prayer. Because wrath, controversy, and disputings will be there. But let's pray with our hands raised, holy hands, without those distractions, without the sins of the world round about us. Then our prayers will be answered. Then we will be drawn closer to Christ closer to one another as the body of Christ. Our prayers for our community will be answered. The prayers for our nation and world will be answered. Let's pray. Father, we bow in your presence this morning and thank you for your great love and care. We thank you for your holiness this morning. Help us to understand it and appreciate it afresh, I pray. Lord, I ask now that your Spirit, the Holy Spirit, would shine a light in any areas of our lives that we need to surrender to you, that we need to ask you for forgiveness, that we would see that we have had hate and wrath and anger in our lives, where we have argued foolishly and We've had controversies that really don't matter in the big picture of things. Lord, help us not to be too sensitive to the hurts of this world or even the potential hurts of fellow Christians. May we keep our eyes focused upon you, the author and the finisher of our, of our faith, I pray. But Lord, you know us. Lord, as I look inward, and as each person looks inward this morning, would you speak to us, I pray. And if you see things you don't like, before we celebrate communion, the time of unity and fellowship, of closeness, would you ask the Lord to forgive you? And if he is speaking to your heart and life, maybe you need to make a relationship right. 
I think of the words of Jesus. He says, if a brother has offended you, you go. Lord, help us not always wait for the other person to make the first move. Lord, help us in faith to live out and follow your principles, and you will be pleased. So, Lord, today we come. Forgive us, cleanse us, sanctify us apart. Then in our prayer time, we can lift holy hands. Hands that have been dedicated to you. Hands that are free of wrath and anger, of disputings and controversies. Hands that lead people to Christ, that point people to you. Hands that do good works. Hands of praise and worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue to prepare your heart as Joe and Daphne will lead us once again in worship. Then we will gather back and we will, in unity and unison, partake of our communion time today.
These are the words that Paul received from the Lord that he shared with the Corinthian church. For I passed on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death till he comes. Father, we pray that you would bless these emblems this morning. We pray that as we participate out of love and obedience to your commands, that you would honor us. Lord, we pray that as we participate today, that there would be healings. The scripture says that by your stripes, we are healed. Lord, we are praying and pleading for healing and restoration of families and marriages. Lord, we are praying for peace and joy. In the midst of trouble, we can have a peace that passes all understanding. So, Lord, you hear our hearts. You know our prayer needs today. We are looking to you. Thank you again that we can love you and serve you, we pray. Amen. Would you take the bread? And Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake? Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often you drink it. Shall we partake? Continue to trust God. Believe him for all your needs. As we prepare for thanksgiving in our hearts, let us take time to be thankful, to have hearts filled with gratitude, and express that to God and express that to those round about us. Thank you for joining us today. If we can be of assistance to you, please contact us. Uh, probably the best number to call or text is 613 Eight five one five seven seven nine. We hope to see you many next Sunday as we relaunch our indoor church services. But especially remember this week and practice it. I would that men everywhere, men, women, children, every believer everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. God bless you.